Chapter 14, A Lonely Woman If I had had any intention of avoiding Mrs. Samway, that intention must inevitably have been frustrated, for her recognition was as instantaneous as my own. Almost as I turned the corner, she looked up and saw me, and a few moments later she rose and advanced in my direction, so that, to an onlooker, it would have appeared as if we had met by appointment. There was obviously nothing for it but to look as pleased as I could manage at such short notice, which I did, shaking her hand with hypocritical warmth. "'And I suppose, Dr. Jardine,' said she, "'you are thinking what a very odd coincidence it is that we should happen to meet here.' "'Oh, I don't know that it is so very odd. I live about here, and I understood you to say that you often come up to the heath. At any rate, our last meeting was a good deal more odd.' "'Yes, indeed. But the truth is that this is not a coincidence at all. I may as well confess that I came here deliberately with the intention of waylaying you. This very frank statement took me aback considerably, so much so that I could think of no appropriate remark beyond mumbling something to the effect that it was very flattering of her. "'I've been trying,' she continued, "'to get a few words with you for some time past, but although I have lurked in your line of march in the most shameless manner, I've always managed to miss you. I thought, from what you told me, that you passed Robinson's shop on your way to the hospital. "'So I do,' I replied mendaciously, for I could hardly tell her that I had lately taken to shooting up by-streets with the express purpose of avoiding that particular stretch of pavement. "'It's rather curious that I never happened to meet you there. However, I didn't, so today I determined to take the bull by the horns and catch you here.' This last statement, like the former ones, gave me abundant matter for reflection. How the deuce had she managed to catch me here? I supposed that she had seen Sylvia and me in the Hampstead Road, and had guessed that we were coming on to this neighbourhood. That was a case of feminine intuition, which, like the bones had a skill, is a wonderful thing, when it comes off. And when it doesn't, one isn't expected to notice the fact. Then she had gone on ahead still guessing at our final destination, and kept us in sight while keeping out of view herself. It was not so very easy to understand, and not at all comfortable to think of, for there was a disagreeable suggestion that she had somehow ascertained Sylvia's place of abode beforehand. And yet, well, the whole affair was rather mysterious. "'You don't ask why it was that I wanted to waylay you,' she said at length, as I made no comment on her last statement. "'There is an old saying,' I replied, "'that one shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth.' "'That is very diplomatic,' she retorted with a laugh. "'But I dare say your knowledge of women makes the question unnecessary.' "'My knowledge of women,' said I, "'might be put into a nutshell and still leave plenty of room for the nut "'and a good fat maggot besides. "'Then I must beware of you.' The man who professes to know nothing of women is the most deep and dangerous class of person. But there is one item of knowledge that you seem to have acquired. You seem to know that women like to have pretty things said to them. If you call that knowledge, said I, you must apply the same name to the mere blind impulse that leads a spider to spin a nice, symmetrical web. She laughed softly and looked up at me with an expression of amused reflection. I am thinking she said, what a very fine symmetrical web you would spin if you were a spider. Possibly, I replied, but it looks as if the roll of blue bottle were the one that is being marked out for me. Oh, not a blue bottle, Dr. Jardine. It doesn't suit you at all. If you must make a comparison, why not say a Goliath beetle and have something really dignified and not so very inappropriate? Well, then, a Goliath beetle, if you prefer it. Not that he would look very dignified, kicking his heels in the elegant web of the superlatively elegant feminine spider. Oh, but that isn't pretty of you at all, Dr. Jardine. In fact, it is quite horrid, and unfair, too, because you are trying to get the information without asking a direct question. What question am I supposed to ask? 
you needn't ask any i will take pity on your masculine pride and tell you why i have been lying in wait for you although i dare say you have guessed the truth is i am simply devoured by curiosity concerning what now how can you ask just think one day i meet you in the hampstead road going about your ordinary business apparently a fixture at least for months a few days later a hundred miles from london i feel myself suddenly seized from behind i turn round and there are you with tragedy and adventure written large all over you i thought the tragedy was rather on your side and so did the ancient mariner with a black bottle and a teacup but i don't wish to discuss the views of that well-meaning old brute i want an explanation i want to know how you came to be in folkestone and in that extraordinary condition i am sure something strange must have happened to you why haven't i as much right to be in folkestone as you have that is mere evasion when i see a man who is usually rather carefully and very neatly dressed walking in the streets of a seaport town without hat or a stick and with a collar that looks as if it had been used to clean out a saucepan and great stains on his clothes i am justified in inferring that something unusual has happened to him i didn't think you had noticed my negligee get-up at the time i did not i was very upset and agitated i just had a lot of worry and was compelled to cross to france at a moment's notice and then there was that horrible horse and the sudden way that you seized me and then got knocked down and the the ancient mariner yes the ancient mariner and the knowledge that i was behaving like an idiot and couldn't help it though you were so nice and kind to me so you see i was hardly conscious of what was happening at the time but afterwards when i had recovered my wits a little i recalled the astonishing figure that you made and i've been wondering ever since what had happened to you i assure you dr jardine you looked as if you might have swum to folkestone did i by jove i exclaimed with a laugh well appearances weren't so very deceptive the fact is that i'd swum part of the way she looked at me incredulously whatever do you mean she asked i mean that you are now looking on a modern and strictly up-to-date edition of simbad the sailor that isn't very explanatory but i suppose it isn't meant to be it is just a preliminary stimulant to whet my appetite for marvels and a most unnecessary one i can assure you for i am absolutely agape with curiosity do go on tell me exactly what had happened to you now the truth is that i had already said rather more than was strictly discreet and would gladly have drawn in my horns but i had evidently let myself in for some sort of plausible explanation and a lack of that enviable faculty that enables its possessor to tell a really convincing and workmanlike lie condemned me to a mere unimaginative adherence to the bold facts though i did make one slight and amateurish effort at prevarication you want a detailed log of simbad's voyages do you said i then you shall have it we will begin at the beginning the port of departure was the embankment somewhere near cleopatra's needle I was leaning over the parapet, staring down at the water like a fool, when some practical joker came along, and, apparently thinking it would be rather funny to give me a fright, suddenly lifted me off my feet. But my joker's friend hadn't allowed for the top heaviness of a person of my height, and, before you could say knife, I had slipped from his hold and taken a most stylish header into the water. Fortunately for me, a barge happened at the moment to be towing past, and— when I had managed to haul myself on board, I fell into the arms of a marine species of good Samaritan, who, not having a supply of the orthodox oil and wine, proceeded to fill me up with hot gin and water, which is distinctly preferable for internal application. Then the Samaritan aforesaid clothed me in gorgeous marine raiment and stowed me in a cupboard to sleep off the oil and wine, which I did after some sixteen hours and then awoke to find our good ship on the broad bosom of the ocean and so not to weary you with the incidents of the voyage i came to folkestone where i found a beautiful lady endeavouring very unsuccessfully to hypnotise a runaway horse 
and so to the adventure of the tarred nets and the ancient mariner with the black bottle. Mrs. Samway smiled a little consciously as I mentioned the last incidents, but the smile quickly faded and left a deeply thoughtful expression on her face. "'You take it all very calmly,' said she, "'but it seems to me to have been a rather terrible experience. You really had a very narrow escape from death.' "'Yes, quite near enough. I'm far from wanting any more from the same tap. "'And I don't quite see why you assume that it was a mere clumsy joke that sent you into the river by accident. "'Why, what else could it have been?' "'It looks more like a deliberate attempt to drown you. "'Perhaps you have some enemy who might want to make away with you.' "'I haven't. "'There isn't a soul in the world who owes me the slightest grudge.' "'That seems rather a bold thing to say. "'But I suppose you know. "'Still, I should think you ought to bear this strange affair in mind "'and be a little careful when you go out at night. "'To avoid the riverside, for instance. "'Have you... "'Did you give any information to the police about this accident, as you call it? "'Good Lord, no! What would have been the use?' "'I thought you might have given them some description of the man who pushed you over.' "'But I never saw him. I don't even know for certain that it was a man. "'It might have been a woman, for all that I can tell.' "'Mrs. Samway looked up at me with that strangely penetrating expression that I'd seen before.' in those singular, pale eyes of hers. "'You don't mean that,' she said. "'You don't really think that it could have been a woman?' "'I don't think very much about it. But as I never saw the person who did me the honour of hoisting me overboard, I'm clearly not in a position to depose as to the sex of that person. But if it was a woman, she must have been an uncommonly strong one.' Mrs. Samway continued to look at me questioningly. "'I thought you seemed to hint at a suspicion that it actually was a woman. "'You would surely be able to tell.' "'I suppose I should, if there were time to think about the matter. "'But you see, before I was fairly aware that anyone had hold of me, "'I was sticking my head into the mud at the bottom of the river, "'which is a process that does not tend very much to clarify one's thoughts.' "'No, I suppose not,' she agreed. "'But it is a most mysterious and dreadful affair.' "'I can't think how you can take it so calmly. "'You don't seem to be in the least concerned by the fact "'that you've been within a hair's breadth of being murdered. "'What do your friends think about it?' "'Well, you see, Mrs. Samway,' I replied evasively, "'one doesn't talk much about incidents of this kind. "'It doesn't sound very credible, "'and one doesn't want to gain a reputation "'as a sort of modern Munchausen.' I shouldn't have told you, but that you were already partly in the secret, and that you cross-examined me in such a determined fashion. But, she exclaimed, do you mean to tell me that you've said nothing to anyone about this extraordinary adventure of yours? No, I don't say that. Of course, I had to give some sort of explanation to my landlady, for instance, but I didn't tell her all that I've told you, and I would rather, if you don't mind, "'that you didn't mention the affair to anyone. "'I should hate to be suspected of romancing.' "'You shan't be through anything that I may say,' she replied, "'though I should hardly think that anyone who knew you "'would be likely to suspect you of inventing imaginary adventures.' "'For some minutes after this we walked on without speaking, "'and from time to time I stole a glance at my companion.' and, once again, I found myself impressed by something distinctive and unusual in her appearance. Her unquestionable beauty was not like that of most pretty women, localized and unequal, having features of striking attractiveness set in an indifferent or even defective matrix. It was diffused and all-pervading, the product of sheer physical excellence. With most women, one feels that the more attractive wares are judiciously pushed to the front of the window, while a discreet reticence is maintained respecting the unpresentable residue. Not so with Mrs. Samway. Her small, shapely head, her symmetrical face, her fine, supple figure, and her easy movements all spoke of a splendid physique. She was not merely a pretty woman. She was that infinitely rarer creature, a physically perfect human being, 
comely with the comeliness of faultless proportion, graceful with the grace of symmetry and strength. Suddenly she looked up at me, with just a hint of shyness and a little heightening of the colour in her cheek. "'Are you going to tell me again, Dr. Jardine, that a cat may look at a king? Or was it that a king may look at a cat?' "'Whichever you please,' I replied. "'We will put them on a footing of equality, excepting that the king might have the better claim if the cat happened to be an exceptionally good-looking cat. But I wasn't really staring at you this time. I was only giving you a sort of friendly look over. You weren't quite yourself, I think, when we met last.' "'No, I certainly was not. So we are now making an inspection. May I ask if I am to be informed of the diagnosis?' as I think you call it. Now, to tell the truth, I had thought her looking rather haggard and worn, and decidedly thinner, and when her sprightliness subsided in the intervals of our somewhat flippant talk, it had seemed to me that her face took on an expression that was weary and even sad, but it would hardly do to say as much. "'It is quite irregular,' I replied. "'The diagnosis is for the doctor. The patient is only concerned with the treatment.' but I'll make an exception in your case, especially as my report is quite unsensational. I thought you looked as if you'd been doing rather too much, and not greatly enjoying the occupation. Am I right? Yes, quite right. I've had a lot of worry and bother lately, and not enough rest and peace. I hope all that is at an end now. I don't know that it is, she replied wearily, or, for that matter, that it will ever be. Fate or destiny, or whatever we may call it, starts us upon a certain road, and along that road we must needs trudge, wherever it may lead. I was rather startled at the sudden despondency of her tone. Apparently the road that Mrs. Samway trod was not strewn with roses. Still, I said, it is a long road that has no turning. It is she agreed, bitterly. But many have to travel such a road, to find the turning at last barred by the churchyard gate. Oh, come, I protested. We don't talk of churchyards at your time of life. We think of the jolly wayside inns, and the buttercups and daisies, and the may blossom and the hedgerows. Churchyard, indeed. We will leave that to the old folk, and the village donkey, if you please. She smiled rather wanly. Her gaiety seemed to have deserted her for good. "'The wayside inns and the wayside flowers,' said she, "'are your portion. At least, I hope so. They are not for me. And, after all, there are worse things to think of than a nice, quiet churchyard, with a village donkey browsing among the graves, as you say.' "'I quite agree with you. From the standpoint of the disinterested spectator, not contemplating freehold investments, nothing can be more delightfully rustic and peaceful. It is the personal application that I object to. Again she smiled, but very pensively, and for a while we walked on in silence. Presently she resumed. I used to think that the shortness of life was quite a tragedy. That was when I was young. But now... When you were young, I interrupted, why... "'What are you now? I can tell you, Mrs. Samway, that there is many a girl of twenty who would be only too delighted to exchange personalities with you, and who would stand to make a mighty fine bargain if she could do it. If you talk like this, I shall have to refer you to the great Leonardo's advice to painters.' "'What is that?' she asked. "'He recommends the frequent use of a looking-glass.' She gave me a quick glance and then blushed so very deeply that I was quite alarmed lest I should have given offence. But her next words reassured me. "'It was nice of you to say that, and most kindly meant. I won't say that I don't care very much how I look, because that would be an ungracious return for your compliment, and it wouldn't be quite true. There are times when one is quite glad to feel that one looks presentable. The present moment, for instance.' I acknowledged the compliment with a bow. "'Thank you,' I said. "'That was more than I deserved. I only wish that your fortune was equal to your looks. But I am afraid it isn't. I have an uncomfortable feeling that you are not very happy.' 
"'I'm afraid I'm not,' she replied. "'Life is rather a lottery, you know, and the worst of it is that you can only take a single ticket. So, when you find that you've drawn the wrong number, and you realize that there is no second chance, well, it isn't very inspiriting, is it?' I had to admit that it was not, and, after a short pause, she continued, "'Women are poor dependent creatures, Dr. Jardine. Dependent, I mean, for their happiness on the people who surround them.' "'But that is true of us all.' "'Not quite. A man, like yourself, for instance, has his work and his ambitions that make him independent of others. But for a woman, whatever pretenses she may make as to larger interests in life, a husband, a home, and one or two nice children— form the real goal of her ambition. "'But you are not a lone spinster, Mrs. Samway,' I reminded her. "'No, I am not. But I have no children, no proper home, and not a real friend in the world. Unless I may think of you as one.' "'I hope you always will,' I exclaimed impulsively, for there was, to me, something very pathetic in the evident loneliness of this woman. She must, I felt, be friendless indeed if she must needs appeal for friendship to a comparative stranger like myself. "'I am glad to hear you say that,' she replied, "'for I am making you bear a friend's burden. I hope you will forgive me for pouring out my complaints to you in this way.' "'It isn't difficult,' said I, "'to bear other people's troubles with fortitude.' But if sympathy is any good, believe me, Mrs. Samway, when I tell you that I am really deeply grieved to think that you are getting so much less out of life than you ought. I only wish that I could do something more than sympathize. I believe you do, she said. I felt, at Folkestone, how kind you were, as a good man is to a woman in her moments of weakness. That is why, I suppose, I was impelled to talk to you like this, and that is why, she added, after a little pause, I felt a pang of envy when I saw you pass with your pretty companion. I started somewhat at this. Where the deuce could she have seen us near enough to tell whether my companion was pretty or not? I turned the matter over rapidly in my mind, and meanwhile I said, I don't quite see why you envied me, Mrs. Samway. "'I didn't say that I envied you,' she replied, with a faint smile and the suspicion of a blush. "'Or her, either,' I retorted. "'We are only the merest acquaintances.' My conscience smote me somewhat as I made this outrageous statement, but Mrs. Samway took me up instantly. "'Then you've only known her quite a short time.' The rapidity with which she had jumped to this conclusion fairly took my breath away, and had answered her question before I was aware of it. But, I added, I don't quite see how you arrived at your conclusion. I thought, she replied, that you seem to like one another very well. So we do, I think. But can't acquaintances like one another? Oh, certainly. But if they are a young man and a maiden, they are not likely to remain mere acquaintances very long. That was how I argued. I see. Very acute of you. By the way, where did you see us? I didn't see you. Of course you didn't. Yet you passed quite close to me on the Spaniard's road, immersed in conversation, and little suspecting that the green eyes of envy were fixed on you. Oh, now, Mrs. Samway, I can't have that. They're not green, you know, although what their exact colour is I shouldn't like to say offhand. What? not after that careful inspection that didn't include the eyes perhaps you wouldn't mind if i made another just to satisfy my curiosity and settle the question for good oh do by all means if it is such a weighty question we both halted and i stared into the clear depths of our singular pale hazel eyes with an impertinent affectation of profound scrutiny while she looked up smilingly into mine Suddenly, to my utter confusion, her eyes filled, and she turned away her head. "'Oh, please forgive me,' she exclaimed. "'I beg your pardon. 
I do beg your pardon most earnestly for being such a wretched bundle of emotions. You would forgive me if you knew what I can't tell you. There is no need, dear Mrs. Samway, I said very gently, laying my hand on her arm. Are we not friends? And may I not give you my warmest sympathy, without asking too curiously what brings the tears to your eyes? I was, in truth, deeply moved, as a young man is apt to be by a pretty woman's tears. But more than this, something whispered to me that my playful impertinence had suddenly brought home to her the void that was in her life, the lack of intimate affection at which she had seemed to hint. And, instantly, all that was masculine in me had risen up with the immemorial instinct of the male in defence of the female. For, whatever her faults may have been, Mrs. Samway was feminine to the fingertips. She pressed my hand for a moment, and impatiently brushed the tears from her eyes. "'I do hope, Dr. Jardine,' she said, looking up at me with a smile, "'that your wife will be a good woman. You'll be a dreadful victim if she isn't, with your quick sympathy and your endless patience with feminine silliness. And now I won't plague you any more with my tantrums. I hope I'm not bringing you a great deal out of your way. You do live in this direction, don't you?' "'Yes, and I've been assuming that my direction was yours, too. Is that right? Are you going back to Hampstead Road?' "'Not at once. I'm going to make a call at Highgate first. "'Then you'll want to go up Highgate Rise, or Swain's Lane, and I will walk up with you, if you'll let me.' "'I think my nearest way will be up the little path that leads out of Swain's Lane. You know it, I expect?' "'Yes. It is locally known as Love Lane. It leads to the crest of the hill.' "'That is right.' You shall see me to the top of it, and then I'll take myself off and leave you in peace. We had by this time crossed Parliament Hill Fields and passed the end of the Highgate Ponds. A few paces more brought us out at the top of the grove, and a few more to the entrance of the rather steep and very narrow lane. For some time Mrs. Samway walked by my side in silence, and, by the reflective way in which she looked at the ground before her, seemed to be wrapped in meditation which I did not disturb. As we entered the lane, however, she looked up at me thoughtfully and said, "'I wonder what you think of me, Dr. Jardine.' It was a fine opening for a compliment, but somehow compliments seemed out of place after what had passed between us. I accordingly evaded the question with another. "'What do you suppose I think of you?' "'I don't know. I hardly know what I think of myself.' You would be quite justified in thinking me rather forward, to waylay you in this deliberate fashion. Well, I don't. Your curiosity about that Folkestone affair seems most natural and reasonable. I'm glad you don't think me forward, she said. But, as to my curiosity, I am beginning to doubt whether it was that alone that determined me of a sudden to come here and talk to you. I half suspect that I was feeling a little more solitary than usual and that some instinct told me that you would be kind to me, and say nice things, and pet me just a little, as you have done. I was deeply touched by her pathetic little confession, so deeply that I could find nothing to say in return. You don't think any the worse of me, she continued, for coming to you, and begging a little sympathy and friendship. As she spoke, she looked up very wistfully and earnestly in my face, and rested her hand for a moment on my arm. I took it in mine, and drew her arm under my own, as I replied, "'Of course I don't. Only I think it a wonder and a shame that my poor friendship and sympathy should be worth the consideration of a woman like you.' She pressed my arm slightly, and, after a little interval, said in a low voice, with just a suspicion of a tremor in it, "'You've been very kind to me, Dr. Jardine.' more kind than you know. I am very, very grateful to you for taking what was really an intrusion so nicely. It was not in the least an intrusion, I protested, and as to gratitude, a good many men would be very delighted to earn it on the same terms. You don't seem to set much value on your own exceedingly agreeable society. 
She smiled very prettily at this, and again we walked on for a while up the slope without speaking. Once she turned her head as if listening for some sound from behind us, but our feet were making so much noise on the loose gravel, and the sound reverberated so much in the narrow space between the wooden fences that I, at least, heard nothing. Presently we turned a slight bend, and came in sight of the opening at the top of the hill, guarded by a couple of posts. Within a few yards of the latter she halted, and withdrawing her hand from my arm, turned round and faced me. "'We must say good-bye here,' said she. "'I wonder if I shall ever see you again.' For a moment I felt a strong impulse to propose some future meeting at a definite date, but fortunately some glimmering of discretion— and perhaps some thought of Sylvia, restrained me. "'Why shouldn't you?' I asked. "'I don't know. But mine is rather a vagabond existence, and I suppose you will be travelling about. I hope we shall meet again soon. But if we do not, I shall always think of you as my friend, and you will have a kind thought for me sometimes, won't you?' "'I shall indeed. I shall think of you very often.' and hope that your life is brighter than it seems to be now. Thank you, she said earnestly. And now, good-bye. She held out her hand, and, as I grasped it, she looked in my face with the wistful, yearning expression that I had noticed before, and which so touched me to the heart that, yielding to a sudden impulse, I drew her to me and kissed her. Dim as was the light of the fading winter's day, I could see that she had in an instant turned scarlet. But she was not angry, for, as she drew away from me, shyly and almost reluctantly, she gave me one of her prettiest smiles and whispered, "Goodbye" again. Then she ran out between the posts, and turning once again, and still as red as a peony, waved me a last farewell. I stood in the narrow entrance looking out after her with a strange mixture of emotions, pity, wonder, and admiration, and a little doubt as to my own part in the late transaction, for I had never before kissed a married woman, and cooling judgment did not altogether approve the new departure. For if Mr. Samway was not all that he might be, still he was Mr. Samway and I wasn't. Nevertheless, I stood and watched my late companion with very warm interest until she faded into the dusk, and even then I continued to stand by the posts, gazing out into the waning twilight and cogitating on our rather strange interview. Suddenly my ear caught a sound from behind me, down the lane, a sound which, while it set my suspicion on the alert, brought a broad grin to my face. It was what I suppose I must call a stealthy footstep, but the stealthiness might have stood for the very type and essence of futility, for, as I've said, the ground sloped pretty steeply and was covered with loose pebbles, whereby every movement of the foot was rendered as audible as a thunderclap. However, absurd as the situation seemed, if the unseen person was really trying to approach by stealth, it was necessary to be on my guard. Moreover, if this should chance to be the person with the nystagmus, the present seemed to be an excellent opportunity for coming to some sort of understanding with him. Accordingly, I wheeled about and began to walk back down the lane. Instantly, the steps no longer stealthy, began to retire. I quickened my pace. The unknown and invisible eavesdropper quickened his. Then I broke into a run, and so did he, notwithstanding which I think I should have had him, but for an untoward accident. The ground was not only sloping, but, under the loose gravel, was as hard as stone. Consequently, the foothold was none of the best, as I presently discovered, for, as I raced down one of the steepest slopes, the pebbles suddenly rolled away under my foot, and I lost my balance. But I did not fall instantly. Half recovering, I flew forward, clawing the air, stamping, staggering, kicking up the gravel, and making the most infernal hubbub and clatter before I finally subsided into a sitting posture on the pebbles. When I rose, the footsteps were no longer audible, though the lower end of the lane was still some distance away. I resumed my progress at a more sedate pace, and kept a sharp lookout for a possible ambush, though the lane was too narrow, even in the darkness that now pervaded it, to furnish much cover to an enemy. Some distance down I came to an opening in the fence, 
where one or two boards had become loose, and was half disposed to squeeze through and explore. But I did not, for, on reflection, it occurred to me that if the man was not there it would be useless for me to go, while if he should be hiding behind the fence it would be simply insane of me to put my head through the hole. When I emerged into the road at the bottom I looked about vaguely, but, of course, there was no sign of the fugitive, nor, indeed, could I have identified him if I had met him. I loitered about undecidedly for a minute or two, and then, realising the futility of keeping a watch on the entrance of the lane for a man whom I could not recognise, and becoming conscious of a ravenous desire for food, I made my way down the grove in the direction of my lodgings. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter 15. Exit Dr. Jardine. My second visit to the Hawthorns, to which I had looked forward with some eagerness, had, after all, to be postponed indefinitely. I say had, since, under the circumstances, it appeared to be so unsafe that I could not fairly take the risk that it involved. I had made the engagement thoughtlessly, and, in my preoccupation with Mrs. Samway, had not realised the indiscretion to which I had committed myself until I was brought back sharply to the actual conditions by the incident in Love Lane which I have mentioned. But after that I saw that it would be the wildest folly to show myself in the vicinity of Sylvia's house. Evidently the spy, after we had given him the slip so neatly, had made direct for my lodgings and lurked in the neighbourhood, and there it must have been that he had picked me up again as I passed with Mrs. Samway. Of course, it was possible that the unseen person in the lane was not really shadowing me at all, but his stealthy approach, his hasty retreat and his mysterious disappearance left me in very little doubt on the subject. I was not very nervous about this enigmatical person on my own account. In spite of my alarming experiences, I found it difficult to take him as seriously as I should have done, and still felt a quite unjustifiable confidence in my capability of taking care of myself. But on Sylvia's account I was exceedingly uneasy. The interest that this man had shown in the unlucky little ornament that she wore associated itself in my mind most disagreeably with a mysterious and terrifying adventure in Millfield Lane, and made me feel that it would be sheer insanity for me to go from my house to hers, and so possibly give this unknown villain the clue to her whereabouts. This conclusion, at which I had arrived overnight, was confirmed on the following morning, for, having taken a brisk walk out in the direction of Harrow, and having kept a very sharp lookout, I was distinctly conscious of the fact that there always appeared to be a man in sight. I never got near him, and was not able to recognise him, but at intervals throughout the morning he continually reappeared in the distance, even on the comparatively solitary country roads and the hedge-divided meadows. It was excessively irritating. Yet what could I do? Even if I could have identified him with the man who had apparently shadowed me before, I really had nothing against him. And cogitating on the matter, with no little annoyance, I determined to take counsel with Thorndyke, and meanwhile to avoid the neighbourhood of the Hawthorns. After lunch I wrote a letter to Sylvia, briefly explaining the state of affairs, and, having given it to our maid to deliver, I took the precaution to go out and saunter towards Kentish town with the object of engaging the spy's attention and preventing him from following my messenger to North End. The rest of the day I spent at home, and occupied my time in writing a long letter to Thorndyke, in which I gave a pretty detailed account of my recent experiences which letter was duly posted by Mrs. Blunt herself in time for the evening collection. I had barely seated myself at the breakfast table on the following morning when a telegram was brought to me. On opening it, I found that it was from Thorndyke, advising me that a letter had been dispatched by hand and asking me to stay at home until I had received it, which I did, and within an hour it arrived and was delivered into my own hands by a messenger boy. It was curt and rather peremptory in tone, desiring me to meet him at one o'clock at Salter's Club in a turning off St. James's Street, and concluding with these somewhat remarkable instructions. 
I want you to wear an overcoat and hat of a distinctive and easily recognizable character, and to take every means that you can of being seen, and, if possible, followed to the club. You had better put a few necessaries in a bag or a suitcase, and tell your landlady that you may not be home tonight. Follow these instructions to the letter, and bring this note with you. At the latter part of these directions I was somewhat disposed to boggle, remembering my worthy teacher's threat to put me somewhere out of harm's way. But Thorndyke was a difficult man to disobey. Suave and persuasive as his manners were, he had a certain final and compelling way with him that silenced objections and produced a sort of frictionless obedience without any sense of compulsion. Hence, notwithstanding a slight tendency to bluster and tell myself that I would see him hang before I would submit to being mollycoddled like an idiot, I found myself, presently, walking down the grove in a buff overcoat and a grey felt hat, carrying a green canvas suitcase in which were packed the necessaries for a brief stay away from home, and bearing in my pocket the incriminating letter. I walked slowly as far as the junction road, in order to give any pursuer a fair opportunity to take up the chase, and to make the necessary observations on my tasteful turn-out. At the junction I waited for a tram, and carefully abstained from staring about in a manner which would have embarrassed any person who might wish unobserved to share the conveyance with me, and from the terminus at Euston Road I proceeded in leisurely fashion on foot still resisting the temptation to look about and see if I had picked up a companion by the way. Salt's Club was domiciled in a typical West End house, situated in a quiet street of similar houses, graced at one end by a cab-stand. I timed my arrival with such accuracy that a neighbouring church clock struck one as I ascended the steps, and on my entering the hall I was met by an elderly man in a quiet livery who seemed to expect me for when i mentioned thorndyke's name he asked dr jardine sir and hardly waiting for my reply showed me to the cloak-room dr thorndyke said he will be with you in a few minutes when you have washed i will show you to the dining-room where he wished you to wait for him i was just a little surprised at even this short delay for thorndyke was the soul of punctuality however I had not to wait long. I had been sitting less than three minutes at a small table laid for two in the deep bay window, scanning the street through the wire gauze blinds, when he arrived. "'I needn't apologize, I suppose, Jardine,' he said, shaking my hand heartily. "'You will have guessed why I have kept you waiting.' "'You flatter me, sir,' I replied with a slight grin. "'I haven't your powers of instantaneous deduction.' "'You hardly needed them,' he retorted. "'Of course, I was watching your approach, and observing the corner by which you entered the street, to see who came after you. "'Did anyone come after me?' "'Several persons. I examined them all very carefully, with a prism binocular that magnifies twelve times linear, and an assistant is now at the same window, the one over this, following the fortunes of those persons with the same excellent glass. Did you spot anyone in particular as looking a likely person? Yes, the second man who came after you seemed to be sauntering in a rather unpurposive fashion, and looking a little obtrusively unconcerned. I noticed, too, that he was carrying an umbrella in his left hand. But we needn't concern ourselves. If anyone is shadowing you, we are certain to see him. He must expose himself to view from time to time, for he can't afford to lose sight of our doorway for more than a few seconds, and there is practically no cover in this street. He might hide in a doorway, I suggested. Ah, oh, mighty! These are all clubs in this street. He'd very soon have the servants out wanting to know his business. No, he'll have to keep on the move, and he'll have to keep mostly in sight of this house. And meanwhile, we are going to take our lunch at our leisure, and have a little talk to while away the time. The lunch was on a scale that my youthful appetite approved strongly, 
though the number of courses and irrelevant time-consuming kickshaws struck me as rather unusual and i never saw a man eat so slowly and delay a meal so much as thorndyke did on that occasion i believe that it took him fully twenty minutes to consume a fried sole and even then he created a further delay by drawing my attention to the skeleton on his plate as an illustration of inherited deformity adjusted to special environmental conditions but all the time whether eating or talking i noticed that his eye continually travelled up and down the stretch of street that was visible through the wire blinds you haven't told me why you sent for me sir i said after waiting patiently for him to open the subject i dare say you have guessed he replied but we may as well thrash the matter out now you realize that you are running an enormous and unnecessary risk by going abroad with this man at your heels well i don't suppose he's following me about from sheer affection no i thought it possible that he might be a plain-clothes policeman but i have ascertained that he is not who he is we don't know but we have the strongest reasons for suspecting his intentions there have been three very determined attempts on your life they were all made with such remarkable caution and foresight that though they failed practically no traces have been left those attempts imply a strong motive though to us an unknown one and that motive presumably still exists your enemy may well be getting desperate and may be prepared to take greater risks to get rid of you and if he is the chances are that he will succeed sooner or later murder isn't very difficult to a cool-headed man who means business then what do you propose sir i propose that you disappear from your ordinary surroundings and come and stay for a time at my chambers in the temple this was no more than i had expected but my jaw dropped considerably notwithstanding it's awfully good of you sir i stammered and so to be sure it was but don't you think it would be simpler to turn the tables on this johnny and shadow him an excellent idea jardine and one i may say that i am acting on at this moment but there isn't so much in it as you seem to think supposing we identify this man and even run him to earth what then we have nothing against him we know of no crime that has been committed we may suspect that the man whom you saw at hampstead had been murdered but we can't prove it we can't produce the body or even prove that the man was dead and we couldn't connect this person with the affair because nobody was known to be connected with it i should like to know who this man is but i don't want to put him on his guard and above all i can't agree to your going about as a sort of live bait to enable us to locate him by the way that man on the opposite side of the street is the one whom i selected as being probably your attendant apparently i was right as this is the third time he has passed do you recognize him i looked attentively at the uncharacteristic figure on the farther side of the street but could find nothing familiar in his appearance no i replied he doesn't look to me like the same man he is dressed differently that's nothing as he has been dressed differently on each occasion and that torpedo beard and full moustache are quite unlike though there's nothing in that either but the man looks different altogether distinctly taller for instance thorndyke chuckled good said he now look at his feet as he passes opposite did you ever see an instep set at that angle to the sole and does not your anatomical conscience cry out at a foot of that thickness yes by jove i exclaimed there's room for a double row of mitted tarsals it's a fake of some kind i suppose cork razors inside high-heeled boots through the glasses i could see that the boots gaped considerably at the instep as they will when there is a pad inside as well as a foot 
but you notice also that the man is dressed for height he has a tall hat a long coat and his shoulders are obviously raised by padding i think there is very little doubt that he is our man it must be a dull job i remarked hanging about by the hour to see a man come out of a house very thorndyke agreed i am quite sorry for the worthy person especially as we are going to play him a rather shabby trick presently what are we going to do i asked we are going to let him in for one of the longest waits he has ever had i am afraid perhaps i had better give you the particulars of our modus operandi first i shall send down to the stand for a hansom which will draw up opposite the club and thereupon i have no doubt our friend will hurry down to the cab stand to be in readiness at any rate i shall let him get down to that end of the street before i do anything more then i shall take the liberty of putting on your coat and hat and go out to the cab with your suitcase in my hand i shall stand on the curb long enough to let our friend get a good view of my back i shall get into the cab give the driver the direction through the trap to drive to the hospital and pay the fare in advance why in advance i asked so that i shall not have to turn round and show my face when i get out at the hospital entrance i assume that your friend will follow me in another hansom also that he will alight at the outer gates whereas i shall drive into the courtyard right up to the main entrance so that he will merely see your hat coat and suitcase disappear into the building then as i say he will be in for an interminable vigil i have a lecture to give this afternoon and when i have finished i shall come away in a black overcoat and tall hat which are at this moment hanging up in the curator's room leaving your friend to wait for the reappearance of your coat hat and suitcase i only hope he won't wait too long why because he may wear out the patience of my assistant i have a plain-clothes man keeping a watch from the window above if your friend sets off in pursuit of your garments as i anticipate the plain-clothes man will go straight to the hospital and take up his post in the porter's lodge which as you know commands the whole street outside the gates and what have i got to do first of all you'll put your toothbrush in your pocket never mind about your razor and let me try on your hat in case we have to pad the lining then when you have seen your friend start off in pursuit and are sure the coast is clear you will make straight for my chambers and wait there for me and supposing the chappie doesn't start off in pursuit supposing he twigs the imposture then the plain-clothes man will go out and threaten to arrest him for loitering with intent to commit a felony that would soon move him on out of the neighbourhood and the officer might accompany him some distance and try to get his address meanwhile you would be off to king's bench walk but wouldn't it be simpler to run the johnny in in any case then we should know all about him no it wouldn't do the police wouldn't actually make an arrest without an information and if they did proceed they would want me to appear that wouldn't suit me at all until we obtain some fresh evidence i don't want this man to get any suspicion that the case is being investigated and now i think the time has come for a move let us go to the cloak-room and see if your hat fits me sufficiently well it was not a good fit being just a shade small but as it was a soft felt this was not a vital defect the overcoat fitted well enough though a trifle long in the sleeves and when thorndyke was fully arrayed in this borrowed plumage his back view so far as i could judge was indistinguishable from my own if you will take out your toothbrush and hand me your suitcase said he i will send for a hansom and then we will watch the progress of events from the dining-room window i handed him the green canvas case and we returned to the dining-room and there when he had ordered the cab 
we took up a position at the window, screened from observation by the wire blinds. "'Our friend,' said Thorndyke, "'was walking towards the right-hand end of the street when we saw him last. "'As the cab-stand is at the left-hand end, "'we may hope to look upon his face once again.' "'As he spoke, the air was rent by the shriek of the cab-whistle, "'and the leading hansom began immediately to bear down on the club. "'It had hardly come to rest at our door "'when a figure appeared from the opposite direction, "'advancing at a brisk walk on our side of the road. "'I recognised him instantly.' as the man to whom Thorndyke had directed my attention, and watched him closely, as he approached, to see if I could identify him with the man who had shadowed Sylvia and me at the picture-gallery. But, though he passed within a few yards of the window, and I felt no doubt that he was the same man, I could trace no definite resemblance. It is true that while actually passing the club he averted his face somewhat, but I had a good view of him within an easy distance, and the face that I then saw was certainly not the face of the man at the gallery. The skilfulness of the make-up, assuming it to be really a disguise, was incredible, and I remarked on it to Thorndyke. Yes, he agreed, a really artistic make-up is apt to surprise the uninitiated. And that reminds me that Polton has instructions to make a few trifling alterations in your own appearance. I stared at him aghast. You don't mean to say, I exclaimed, that you contemplate making me up. We won't discuss the question now, he replied a little evasively. You talk it over with Polton. It is time for me to go now, as our quarry has considerately acted up to our expectations. He little knows what confusion of our plans he would have occasioned by simply staying at the other end of the street. The spy had, in fact, now halted opposite the cab-stand, and was apparently making some notes in a pocket-book, facing meanwhile in our direction. With a few parting instructions to me, Thorndyke picked up the suitcase and hurried out, and I saw him dart down the steps, with his face turned somewhat to the right, and stand for a few seconds at the edge of the pavement with his back to the cab-stand, but in full view, looking at his watch as if considering some appointment. Suddenly he sprang into the cab, and, pushing up the trap, gave the driver his instructions, and handed up the fare. At the same moment I saw the unknown shadower hail a hansom, and, scrambling to the footboard, give some brief directions to the driver. Then Thorndyke's cabman touched his horse with the whip, and away he went at a smart trot. But hardly had the cab turned the first corner, when the second hansom rattled past the club in hot pursuit. I was about to turn away from the window, when a tall, well-dressed man ran down the steps, and immediately signalled to the cab-stand with his stick. Thinking it probable that this was the plain-clothes policeman, I stopped to watch, and when I had seen him enter the cab and drive off in the same direction as the other two, I decided that the show was over, and that it was time for me to take my departure, which I did, after stuffing a couple of envelopes into the lining of Thorndyke's hat to prevent it from slipping down towards my ears. That my arrival at number 5A King's Bench Walk was not quite unexpected, I gathered not only from the fact that the oak stood wide open, revealing the inner door, but from the instantaneous way in which this latter opened in response to my knock, and something gleeful and triumphant in Mr. Polton's manner, as he invited me to enter, stirred my suspicions and aroused vague forebodings. He helped me out of my, or rather Thorndyke's, overcoat, and, having taken the hat from me, peered inquiringly into its interior and fished out the two envelopes which he politely offered to me. Then, having disposed of his employer's property, he returned to confront me, and, wrinkling his countenance into a most singular and highly corrugated smile, he opened his mouth and spoke. "'So you've come, sir, the doctor tells me, to take sanctuary for a time with us from the malice of your enemies.' "'I don't know about that,' I replied. "'But there is a cock-eyed transformationist who seems to be dodging about after me and Dr. Thorndyke thinks I'd better give him the go-by for the present. "'And very proper, too, sir. Discretion is the better part of valour, as the proverb says, though I really could never see that it is any part at all. But no doubt our forefathers who made the proverb knew best. Did the doctor mention that he'd given me certain instructions about you?' "'He said that I was to talk over some question with you, but I didn't quite follow him. What were his instructions?' Polton rubbed his hands, and his face became more crinkly than ever. 
the doctor instructed me he replied looking at me hungrily and obviously making a mental inventory of my features to effect certain slight alterations in your outward personality oh did he said i and what does he mean by that does he mean that you are to make me up as an old woman or a nigger minstrel not at all sir replied polton neither of those characters would be at all suitable they would occasion remark which it is our object to avoid and as to a negro minstrel his presence in chambers would undoubtedly be objected to by the benchers but i expostulated why any disguise at all if i am to be boxed up in these chambers the chap he isn't likely to come and look through the keyhole he wouldn't see anything if he did said polson i fitted these locks but you see sir many strangers come to these chambers and then too you might like to take a little exercise about the inn or the gardens that would probably be quite safe if you were unrecognizable but otherwise i should think inadmissible and really sir he continued persuasively if you do a thing at all you may as well do it thoroughly the doctor wishes you to disappear then disappear completely don't do it by halves i could not but admit to myself that this was reasonable advice nevertheless i grumbled a little sulkily it seems to me that dr thorndyke is making a lot of unnecessary fuss it is absurd for an able-bodied man to be sneaking into a hiding-place and disguising himself like a runaway thief i can offer no opinion on that sir said polton but you're wrong about the doctor he is a cautious man but he's not nervous or fussy you'd be wise to act as he thinks best i'm sure very well i said i won't be obstinate when do you want to begin on me i should like replied polton brightening up wonderfully at my sudden submission to have you ready for inspection by the time that the doctor returns if agreeable to you sir i would proceed immediately then in that case said i we had better adjourn to the green room forthwith if you please sir replied polton and with this having opened the door and cautiously inspected the landing he conducted me up the stairs to the floor above, the rooms of which appeared to be fitted as workshops and laboratories. In one of the former, which appeared to be Polton's own special den, I saw my watch hanging from a nail, with a rating-table pinned above it, and proceeded to claim it. "'I suppose, sir,' said Polton, reluctantly taking it from its nail and surrendering it to me, "'as you are going to reside on the premises and I can keep it under observation, you may as well wear it. The present rate is plus one point three seconds daily, and now I will trouble you to sit down on this stool and take off your collar. I did as he bade me, and, meanwhile, he turned up his cuffs and stood a little way off, surveying me as a sculptor might survey a bust on which he was at work. Then he fetched a large cardboard box, the contents of which I could not see, and fell to work. His first proceeding was to oil my hair thoroughly part it in the middle and brush it smoothly down either side of my forehead next he shaved off the outer third of each eyebrow and having applied some sort of varnish or adhesive he proceeded to build up with a number of short hairs a continuation of the eyebrows at a higher level the result seemed to please him amazingly for he stepped back and viewed me with an exceedingly self-satisfied smirk it is really surprising sir said he how much expression there is in the corner of an eyebrow you look a completely different gentleman already then said i there is no need to do any more we can leave it at this oh no we can't sir polton replied hastily making a frantic dive into the cardboard box begging your pardon sir it is necessary to attend to the lower part of the face in case you should wish to wear a hat which would cover the hair and throw the eyebrows into shadow he reproduced from the box an undeniable false beard of the torpedo type and approached me holding it out as if it were a poultice you are not going to stick that beastly thing on my face i exclaimed gazing at it with profound disfavour now sir protested polton pray be patient we will just try it on and the doctor shall decide if it is necessary with this he proceeded to affix the abomination to my jowl with the aid of the same sticky varnish that it used previously and having attached a moustache to my upper lip worked carefully round the edges of both with a quantity of loose hair which he stuck on the skin with the adhesive liquid and afterwards trimmed off with scissors the process was just completed 
and he had stepped back once more to admire his work when an electric bell rang softly in the adjoining room. "'There's the doctor,' he remarked. "'I'm glad we're ready for him. Shall we go down and submit our work for his inspection?' I assented readily, having some hopes that Thorndyke would veto the beard, and we descended together to the sitting-room, where we found that Jervis and his principal had arrived together. As to the former, he greeted my entrance by staggering back several paces with an expression of terror and then seated himself on the edge of the table, and laughed with an air of enjoyment that was almost offensive, particularly to Polton, who stood by my side, rubbing his hands and smiling with devilish satisfaction. "'I assume,' Thorndyke said gravely, "'that this is our friend Jardine.' "'It isn't,' said Jervis. "'It's a shop-walker from Wallace's. I recognized him instantly.' "'Look here,' I said with some heat. It's all very well for you to make me up like Charlie's aunt, and then jeer at me. But what's the use of it? The 5th of November's past. My dear Jardine, Thorndyke said, soothingly, you are confusing your sensations with your appearance. I dare say that make-up is rather uncomfortable, but it is completely successful, and I must congratulate Polton, for the highest aim of a disguise is the utterly commonplace and i assure you that you are now a most ordinary-looking person fetch the looking-glass from the office polton and let him see for himself i gazed into the mirror which polton held up to me with profound surprise there was nothing in the least grotesque or unusual in the face that looked out at me only it was the face of an utter stranger and as thorndyke had said a perfectly commonplace stranger at whom no one would look twice in the street Grudgingly, I acknowledged the fact, but still objected to the beard. "'Do you think it's really necessary, sir, in addition to the other disfigurements?' "'Yes, I do,' replied Thorndyke. "'It is only a temporary expedient, because, in a fortnight, your own beard will have grown enough to serve with a little artificial reinforcement. And,' he continued, as Polton retired with a gratified smile, I am anxious that your disappearance shall be complete. It is not only a question of your safety, although that is very urgent, and I feel myself responsible for you, as we are not appealing to the police. There are other issues. Assuming, as we do assume, that some crime has been committed, the lapse of time must inevitably cause some of the consequences of that crime to develop. If the man whose body you saw at Hampstead was really murdered, he must presently be missed and inquired for. Then we shall learn who he was, and perhaps we may gather what was the motive of the crime. Then your secret enemy will be left unemployed, and may produce some fresh evidence, for he can't wait indefinitely for your reappearance, and, finally, certain inquiries which I am making may set us on the right track. And, if they do, you must remember, Jardine, that you are probably the sole witness to certain important items of evidence, so you must be preserved in safety as a matter of public policy, apart from your own prejudices in favour of remaining alive. "'I didn't know that you were actually working at the case,' I said. Have you been following up that man Gill of the Mineral Water Works? I followed him up to the vanishing point. He has gone and left no trace, and I have been unable to get any description of him. Then, said I, if it is allowable to ask the question, in what direction have you been making inquiries? I have been interesting myself, Thorndyke replied, in the other case, that of your patient Mr. Maddock as the attacks on you seemed to be associated with his neighbourhood rather than with that of Hampstead. I have examined his will at Somerset House, and am collecting information about the persons who benefited by its provisions. Especially I am making some inquiries about a legatee who lives in New York, and concerning whom I am rather curious. I can't go into further details just now, but you will see that I am keeping the case in hand, you must remember that, at any moment, fresh information may reach me from other sources. 
my practice is a very peculiar one and there are few really obscure cases that are not sooner or later brought to me for an opinion and meanwhile i am to eat the bread of idleness here and wait on events you won't be entirely idle thorndyke replied we shall find you some work to do and you will extend your knowledge of medico-legal practice you write shorthand fairly well don't you yes and i can draw a little if that is of any use both accomplishments are of use and even if they are not we should have to exercise them for the sake of appearances it will certainly become known that you are here so it better make no secret of it but find you such occupation as will account for your presence and as you will have to meet strangers now and again we must find you a name what do you think of william morgan howard it will do as well as any other i replied very well then william morgan howard let it be and in case you might forget your alias as the crooks are constantly doing we will drop the name of jardine and call you howard even when we're alone it will save us all from an untimely slip to this arrangement also i agreed with a sour smile and so with some physical discomfort in the neighbourhood of the lower jaw and a certain relish of the novelty and absurdity of my position i placed myself under the name of howard on the roster of thorndyke's establishment End of chapter 15